Um, good morning, class. This is the recording for section um, 1.6a. And so in this section, we'll talk about how to solve radical equations, rational exponent equations, and eventually absolute value equations. So this section is very lengthy, and I apologize for how long the video will run. Um, but of course, at any point in time, you can pause, stop, rewind, fast forward, um, whatever you need to do to get uh, just the material that you need, okay? Um, ideally, you want to watch the entire video at least once from beginning to end, and then later as you're working on your homework assignments, you can um, jump to the sections um, that are most important for you to complete your homework, okay? Um, so the first, and there's another type of equation that's not mentioned in here, but there are polynomial equations. Now those are typically equations we've already been solving. Um, the most famous polynomial that we, polynomial type of equation that we've been solving is the quadratic um, equation. And the way we learned to solve quadratic equations was one by factoring, then two by completing the square and then extracting roots, and then three just extracting roots where you don't necessarily need to complete the square, okay? So the first section or the first topic we have here is polynomials. So in this section, you'll extend your techniques for solving equations to nonlinear and non-quadratic equations. Um, at this point in the text, you have the four basic methods, which are factoring, extracting roots, completing the square, and we will have the factoring for a uh, quadratic formula but we haven't discussed the quadratic formula just yet as of right now, okay? That will actually, this is lecture, um, I believe 11, no, lecture 10, and the quadratic formula won't be until lecture 12, okay? So the main goal of this section is just how to learn to rewrite nonlinear equations in a way that you can apply one of those methods, okay? So, for the first one, the first kind of equation, we have polynomials. That's basically where you have integer, not even integers, you have whole number exponents. So exponents of one, two, three, four, five, and a constant. Okay. This guy's the constant. This is x to the one power with the coefficient in front, x to the second power with the coefficient in front, the cube with the coefficient in front, all the way until the highest exponent. Okay. Um, so when we're solving polynomial equations, essentially what you want to do is you want to write the polynomial in its general form with zero on one side, okay? And so then in order for me to do that for this particular problem, I would have to subtract 48x squared on both sides of that equation, resulting in this equation. Once you have it in its general form, then you can go ahead and factor out a common factor, okay? So when I'm factoring out the common factor here, it would be 3x squared. And so I'm left with x squared minus 16. Now, how good you are at factoring depends on how fast you'll be able to do this step, okay? Also from here, I notice this is a difference, a subtraction of two perfect squares, okay? Now, because of that, we'll use the difference of squares formula. So x times x is x squared, four times negative four is, or four times four is 16 one with a positive, one with a negative, according to the formula, right? So then once this is completely factored, you just set each factor equal to zero. So notice here, they set three X squared equal to zero. They divided by three on both sides. That resulted in X squared equal to zero. Then they took the square root on both sides, which resulted into X equaling plus or minus zero. And since zero is a neutral number, there's no positive zero and negative zero. It's just zero, okay? which is where the first solution comes from. Then if you take the second factor, um, x plus four equal to zero, you would have the minus four on both sides resulting in x equal to negative four. And for the last factor equal to zero, you would have to add four on both sides resulting in the solution x equals positive four. Then you would have to check all of your solutions. So going back to the original equation, it must be in the original equation. If I plug in zero for X on both sides, I do get zero on the left and zero on the right. So zero checks out. If I plug in negative four on, for X on the left and on the right, 
If I plug this in my calculator, I get 768. And if I plug this expression in the calculator, I get 768. So they are equivalent, so negative four does check out. Then you're gonna plug in positive four for X in the original equation. This side computes to 768. This side also computes to 768. So which means positive four also checks out, which means all three of those answers, zero, four, and negative four are all solutions to this polynomial equation. So one thing that needs to be mentioned is that um, if you do notice that um, you can divide by x squared or any variable, um, notice what will happen, especially with the problem we just had, okay? So if I had three x to the fourth equal to 48 x squared, and I notice, hey, they both have x squared, I'm just gonna divide both sides by x squared. What happens is, is here you get three x squared, here you get 48, you might be tempted to divide by three on both sides, right? Which is not wrong to do. Um, and then you'll get this. And then to get X alone, you'll take the square root of both sides, resulting in X equal to plus or minus the square root of 16, which means X equals plus or minus four. However, doing that, you lose the solution X equal to zero. So you'll never get that third answer doing it this way. So what you need to remember is do not ever, 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 do not divide each side of an equation by a variable, ever, okay? Do not divide by a variable. That will cause you to lose um, a solution, okay? You must get all of the factors to one side, all of the terms to one side, and then factor and set each factor equal to zero, okay? So... In the polynomial equations, we have equations that are called quadratic type. So the equation itself may not be a quadratic, but it does fit the quadratic type, okay? And I have three examples here. Here's the first example. Here's the second example. And then here's the third example, okay? And in all of these examples, I want you to recognize the pattern of how to be able to tell whether or not you have a quadratic type, okay? First of all, you probably need to have a constant here. So notice that in all three of my examples, I do have a constant, okay? Then the other thing you need to recognize is that whatever this expression is, I don't care what the expression is, you're going to take the exponent. And if you were to double this exponent, you would get the exponent in the front, okay? For instance, here, my exponent is two. If I double that, I get four, and that does match. So this is a quadratic type. I'll talk about all of this in a minute, okay? Then from here, if you take this guy's exponent and you double it, one third plus one third is two thirds, that does match. So you have your exponent, your double exponent, and your constant. This is a quadratic type. Now here, it may be a little bit difficult to tell, but you do have to remember that the square root of X can be written as an exponent and that exponent is one half. So if I take that exponent of one half and I double it, one half plus one half is a whole, one whole. This does have an exponent of an invisible one, okay? So this also, and it has a constant. So it also fits the description of a quadratic type. Now notice what we do is we take without this coefficient, we take the expression without the coefficient and we let u equal that expression, okay? Then if you square both sides of this equation, you get an expression for u squared. And so then you do substitution. Instead of writing x to the fourth, we'll write u squared. So this becomes a u squared. And then instead of writing x squared, we'll write u. So this becomes b u and then your plus C. And now it's a quadratic equation in terms of U, okay? Same thing here. You're going to, without the, without the coefficient, you're gonna let that expression be the U, square both sides, and then you'll have an expression for U squared. So this X to the two thirds becomes U squared, this X to the one third becomes U, and then the constant is still the constant. 
Same thing here, without the coefficient, you're going to let that become u, square both sides of this equation, and you should end up with an expression for u squared. So use this x will become u squared, the square root of x will become u, and then you have your constant. So all three of those are of quadratic type, and we know how to solve quadratic equations. One, we can factor them, two, we could extract roots, or three, we can do completing the square and then extracting roots. So we'll have some practice with those quadratic types when we get to the end of this section, okay? So one of the uh, other types of equations that we have are radical equations. Now radicals are anything with the house. It could be a regular square root, it could be a cube root, a fourth root, or a fifth root, okay? Um, but the steps to solve any radical equation is to isolate a radical. So notice that it says a radical equation may have one or more radicals, okay? So I just tell you to isolate a radical. If there's only one radical, then that's the one you're gonna isolate. If there's two radicals, then you're gonna pick one to isolate, okay? After you've isolated a radical, you're going to apply its index as an exponent on both sides. What will that do to the house is it will cancel out the house and then you won't have a house anymore. But whatever's on the other side, whether it has radicals or doesn't have radicals, you're going to have to simplify that other side, okay? So step three does say to simplify. Once you've simplified everything on both sides of the equation, you're going to reassess what type of equation you have. So at the beginning, I had a radical equation and that was my assessment. My assessment was, I have a radical equation. I'm gonna solve it by the steps of solving radical equations. But after you apply that exponent and you simplify, you're going to need to reevaluate what kind of equation it's turned into, okay? Is it still radical equation? Does it still have another radical in it? Does it not have any radicals? And is it a fraction equation now? Is it a regular polynomial equation now? Is it a quadratic, specifically quadratic uh, equation now? Is it a linear equation now? What kind of equation does it look like now? Okay, and then depending on what it looks like, that is what will guide you the rest of the way to be able to finish solving that problem, okay? So if it's a polynomial, we'll get it equal to zero and factor. If it's a quadratic, we'll get it equal to zero and factor. If we can't factor, we'll go try uh, completing the square, okay? So here is our first equal, uh, equation, part, the first part. This one has one radical. The original equation is the square root of 2x plus 7, then outside of the house is a minus x equal to 2, okay? Now I know that my first step is to isolate a radical, and I only have one radical in this equation, okay? So my job is to get this radical by itself. So what we need to do is get rid of this minus x. Now in order to move a whole term over, you're going to have to add. You always use add or subtract to move a whole term over. Okay, you only divide when you're trying to divide a part of that term. For instance, 2x, if I just wanted to get rid of the two, I would have to divide by two. Um, but if I wanted to move the whole 2x over, I would have to use the opposite sign to move it over. Like either if it's plus, I would use minus. If it was negative, I would have used plus, okay? So this is a minus x, which means I need to add x to both sides. And over here, they just cancel, leaving me with my radical by itself. And over here, you could have written two plus x, but we know with addition, you can't swap them over. So you can also write it as x plus two. Had you left it at two plus x, all that would have happened is these terms would have been backwards, okay? You would have had the positive four here, then the four x, and then the x squared, okay? Or if you rearrange them in the right order later anyway, they would still come out the exact same, okay? So we have done step one, which was to isolate the radical. Now step two is to apply the index as an exponent on both sides. What is the index of this radical that we just isolated? It's a square root, okay? Which means I need to apply a square to both sides of the equation. Now notice my parentheses. I've taken the whole expression on the left-hand side and squared it and the entire expression on the right-hand side and squared it. 
Left-hand side is simple enough, right? A house and a square, square root and a square undo each other. So they basically make each other disappear. And all I have left is the inside, which was 2x plus 7. Whereas over here, I have to actually square that. So I have to do x plus 2 times itself and then start distributing everything out so that I could get all four of these terms and then eventually combine my like terms, okay? And so that's where this x squared plus 4x plus 4 comes from. Here's where you would reassess, okay? So now that the left-hand side is simplified, I cannot, there's no more like terms. The right side is completely simplified. Again, no more like terms. I would look at what I have. And what I have here now is an x squared problem, which is a quadratic or a polynomial. And the only way to solve quadratics or polynomials right now, or the best way is to get them in their general form to see if we can factor, okay? So I do have x squared on this side of the equation. So then I do wanna move these two terms over there with it, okay? So I'm gonna subtract two x from both sides, and then I'm going to subtract seven from both sides. That will result in a zero on the left-hand side, and I'll have x squared, positive 2x and a negative three on the right-hand side. Then from here, I would factor. And again, depending on how well you have become at factoring, this step may take longer for some than it does for others, okay? You really need to practice that factoring. If I were you and you do not know how to factor yet, is go back to that uh, P.4 homework and just keep trying those problems over and over and over and over until you get the process down, okay? Because it is gonna be super important the entire rest of the semester. And it's something that needs to be done so fast because that is like one small step to the whole problem, okay? It has to start being, you have to start being able to do those like instantly almost, okay? You should be able to look at this and just instantly know what the factors are gonna be, okay? So, or if at all, like take a minute, literally just one minute to factor it, okay? It should not take that long at this point. That is how fast this class is moving, okay? It is two classes in one semester. So there, there are things in this class that normally you'd have like two, three weeks to absorb. And in here, you have a couple of days to absorb it, okay? So you really have to take that time to get this stuff mastered, okay? It takes time. There's no way of avoiding it. If you want to be able to do things quickly later, you have to take the time to understand what's going on at the beginning, okay? Um, and I know that from the results of that test one, there's a lot of you that do not know how to factor at all, okay? So you have to go back and you have to learn how to factor. You cannot continue and I promise you, you will not pass the class. I can tell you that you won't pass the class if you don't know how to factor. There are like almost every test is gonna have problems that's gonna require you to factor. Let's just put it that way. And a significant amount of those problems are gonna require you to factor. So there's literally no way of passing the class if you don't know how to factor, okay? Um, you have to know how to factor. So like I said, if you're struggling with factoring, make sure that you go back to that R.4 homework. And even though you can't get credit for it, just look at those values, look at those problems and keep trying to factor them until you get them correct, okay? Anyway, um, I just felt that was super important to mention, okay? So this step, you know, you may not understand how to go from here to here right away, but you need to, okay? Um, once you have it factored though, then you just set each factor equal to zero. So if you set x plus three equal to zero, you'll minus three on both sides and get the equation x equals negative three. And then if you set um, x minus one equal to zero, and then that means you would have to add one on both sides, you would get the result x equals one. Now it says by checking these values, you can determine that the only solution is x equal to one. So why is x equal to negative three not a solution? Essentially, it didn't check out. What you would do is you would plug negative three into your original equation, which was this. 
this was the original equation. And if you plug negative three in for X in the whole equation, you end up with two times negative three plus seven and then minus this negative three. So two times negative three is negative six plus seven is one. Now the square root of one is one and this double negative will turn to plus. One plus three is not equal to two. So this is a false statement, which tells us that negative three is not a solution. It must check out in order for it to be a solution, okay? Now, if we check x equal to positive one, we're gonna plug in one here and one there. So we plugged it in and then two times one is two, two plus seven is nine and the square root of nine is three. And then here's my minus one, three minus one does equal two. So in this case, we get a true statement, okay? Um, now, now that we have a true statement, um, that means that this one is a solution, okay? So we have one solution, which is X equal to one. Whenever you have these extra guys, you did all the math, correct? It just so happens that when we solve equations with radicals, absolute values, even fractions, you can sometimes get extra answers, okay? They're called, negative three is called an extraneous solution. It's a solution that comes out through the process of mathematics, but when you go back to check it to make sure that it actually is a solution, it's not. It's just this extra solution you get when you go through the mechanics of math but it's not actually a valid solution, okay? Um, however, when you do go through the mechanics of math, you should come up with all solutions. Um, you just may have extras. It won't happen that you solve the problem following the rules and then you don't get all the answers, okay? As long as you're following all the rules, you will get all the answers, but you may get extras, okay? Um, so that was how we solved when the equation had just one radical. We got it by itself, then we squared both sides, then we simplified, and then we, we solved the resulting equation, which was a quadratic, okay? And we solved that quadratic by factoring. In this second part problem, part B, notice that there are two radicals here, okay? And so the idea is, is that we have to isolate one of them. Typically, when you're going to choose which one to isolate, I would highly suggest that you isolate the positive um, radical if one of them is negative and the other is positive. If both are positive, then just pick one, okay? Um, so in this case, this radical is positive and this radical is negative. So I'm actually going to isolate the positive radical, which means I need to get rid of this other radical. So since I'm subtracting the radical, I'm gonna do the opposite to move it over to the other side. I'm gonna add this radical and I'm gonna add that radical to the other side as well. So on the left-hand side, it basically cancels it out and I just have the square root of two X minus five all by itself. Over here, there's really not much I can do. And instead of writing one plus the radical, you can swap it around and write the radical plus one. They're equivalent, they're the same, okay? Then this has like a little tiny index of two because it's a square root, which means I will apply that index as my exponent on both sides of the equation, okay? On the left-hand side, the square root and the square exponent will cancel, leaving me with just the two X minus five. Whereas over here, I have to actually square that. So I wrote the square root of X minus three plus one times itself, the square root of X minus three plus one. And then I started the foiling process. So the first two together is going, they both have a house, so I can just multiply the insides together. But anything times itself means it's gonna be that thing squared, right? Then I'm gonna multiply this times this. This is a radical, this is not a radical. So all that happens is that this number or whatever, even if it's an expression, becomes the coefficient here. Okay, so I just have one and then the square root of X minus three. The same thing happens when I multiply those two. I just end up with positive one and then the square root of three. 
And then finally, positive one times positive one is going to be a positive one. So remember the house and the square will cancel. So I will get X minus three. Here I have one of these radicals plus another one of these radicals. So I, honestly, I now have two of these radicals. And then this plus one just came down. And then finally, you can combine the negative three and the positive one to get this negative two. So notice they have X, they have negative three and positive one is this negative two. And then they have plus two square root of X minus three, okay? Now, here I have simplified everything I can. I just can't combine these three terms, these three terms because they're not like terms. This one has an X, this one doesn't, and this one has a radical and the other two didn't, okay? So when I'm looking at this, I need to reassess that. And that looks like it's still a radical equation to me. So when that happens, the point is to isolate the radical term again. So this is the radical term. Notice that it's a positive two square root of X minus three. So that's what I want to get by itself. I'm not trying to get rid of the coefficient. I don't want just the radical by itself. I want the whole radical term by itself, okay? So notice I'm gonna minus X and I'm gonna add two to get rid of these two guys that don't have the square root. So when I minus that, I get a positive X. And when I add two, I get a negative three on the left side. And over here on the right, I just get the two square root of X minus three. Now, once you isolate the radicals, you're supposed to identify what the little index is. And then you're supposed to apply that index as an exponent on both sides of the equation. So over here, I applied it, and over here, the whole thing is squared, okay? Now, you can apply this rule here that says if you have two things that are multiplied together, not when two things are subtracted, right? So when there's a subtraction, I had to write it twice and then foil it all out, okay? Over here, though, this two is multiplied by that radical. And so if I remember my exponent properties, I can just apply that square to both of those factors. So I can apply the square to the two and then the square to the radical because the two and the radical were in fact multiplied together. So if I square the two, I get four. And if I square the radical, the house will just go away, okay? But I'm not gonna have just four times X. I'm gonna have four times everything that was inside that radical. So notice that the parentheses are still stuck around the, the X minus three. Eventually, I will distribute that four, giving me four X minus 12. And if I combine my like terms here, I end up with the expression X squared minus six X plus nine. Now, if you look at this equation and you reassess it, okay, this is still a quad, or this is now a quadratic equation. No more radicals no more anything weird going on, okay? So how do we solve that? We get it equal to zero. So we're gonna minus the four X and we're gonna add the 12. On both sides, we do the same thing, okay? Here we'll get X squared minus 10 X plus 21. And on the right-hand side, this should become zero, okay? From there, you wanna factor it. Again, that step needs to be quick. So you need to practice your factoring if you want to be um, if you want to be able to do this test with the amount of time that you have to take the test, okay? You have to get to the point where you have mastered this stuff before you go take a test, okay? It's not a point of, I've been exposed to this stuff as I watched your videos and I tried my homework and then now I'm going to take the test on it. That is not how it works. You need to have mastered this stuff before you go take that test, okay? That is how much time needs to be put into it so that you have it mastered before you take a test on it, okay? So all of this, you guys have a lot of making up to do because the first four weeks of the semester, I can promise you, I only have like maybe four students out of, out of five in my face-to-face -face class and 10 that are online out of 15 students, there's probably only four of you that know how to factor really well, just four. So that's on you, you have to practice. You have to keep practicing until you are super awesome at it.
Okay. Don't just, oh, I got the homework done. I'm done. No, if you can factor anything and everything I throw at you, then you're done. Okay. Go flip through the book randomly and see if you can factor it. Okay. That's how you know you're a pro at it and you need to be a pro at it to keep moving forward. Okay. If you have a gap here and a gap there and a gap there and a gap there, before you know it, you know nothing and you're unprepared for the next content. Okay. So once we have this factored, we're going to set each factor equal to zero, and then we're going to solve each equation and we get two solutions. Now this says that if you check these into the original, they will check out, okay? So remember what the original equation was. The original equation was the square root of 2x minus 5 minus the square root of x minus 3 equal to 1. And this minus was not inside the house, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check both of my answers in this equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in the x value on the left-hand side, and when we hit enter, we should get 1. If we do not, then, this, then that... Um, solution that we got is not actually a solution. It's one of those extraneous solutions, right? So first I'm gonna check x equal to three. So square root of two times three minus five, let me get out of the house, hit the minus, square root of three minus three, get out of the house. And if I hit enter, it needs to equal one, okay? And it does. So this is in fact a actual solution, okay? Now I'm gonna plug in seven for X. In my calculator, I just copied the old expression and I'm gonna change the three that I plugged in to a seven, okay? So now I've plugged in a seven here and I plugged in a seven there. And when I hit enter, it should come out to equal one and it does. So both of those answers have been verified and both of them are solutions. So we've seen a problem, an example where um, you got two answers and one was an extraneous solution and then the other was an actual solution. Here in example two or part two, now we've gotten two solutions and both were actual solutions. Now it hasn't happened yet, but just FYI, if you get two solutions and both of them do not work, they do not check out, then what you would say is that that equation has no solution. So you find all of them. If none of them check out, your answer is no solution. If one of them checks out, then you have one solution. If two of them check out, you have two solutions. And if I had three solutions and all three checked out, then all three would be solutions, okay? But you definitely have to check your answers. Okay, so the next topic is going to be absolute value equations. Now, for absolute value equations, it's important to remember that the absolute value of a positive number is a positive number. The absolute value of a negative number is also a positive number, okay? So if I'm taking the absolute value of an expression and I'm saying that that will eventually equal three, that means that whatever's inside must be three or negative three, because I know that the absolute value of three will equal three, and I know the absolute value of negative three will also equal three, okay? And if I solve this equation by adding two to both sides, I end up with the solution x equals five. And if I solve the bottom equation by adding two to both sides, I will get the solution x equals negative one. And so if I were to plug in either one of these numbers into this expression and then eventually take the absolute value, I do get positive three. So both of these would be my solutions, okay? So here's how you would solve an absolute value equation. The first thing you wanna do is isolate your absolute value expression. Isolate the absolute value expression. Okay, that's the first thing you want to do. Then the next thing you want to do is identify which case you have. Do you have where your absolute value of your expression equals a positive number? 
do you have it so that your expression is supposed to equal zero? Or do you have an equation where your, the absolute value of your expression is supposed to equal a negative number, okay? Depending on which one of those situations you have, it tells you what you will be doing to solve, okay? So if I have it equal to a positive number, just like in this example, I will take whatever's on the inside of those bars and equal it to that positive number. Then I'll say the word or, that same expression will equal the negative value of that number, exactly as we did here. The expression x minus two equal to the positive three as it was, and then the x minus two expression equal to the opposite, negative three, okay? And then you solve those resulting equations. Now, why do we set it equal to positive of the number and negative of the number? Because we know that whether the inside is the positive number or the negative number, when you put those bars around it, it will come out to that same positive number, okay? Now, case two is if the absolute value of the expression equals zero. In that case, there's no such thing as setting it equal to positive zero and then negative zero. Negative zero doesn't exist. Zero is neutral, devoid of sign, okay? So you would literally only have one equation to solve, and that's where the expression itself equals zero because the absolute value of zero is zero, okay? No other number inside the bars is gonna come out to equal zero. Now, case three is what happens if I have the absolute value bars and then I have an equal to a negative. In that case, the answer is simply just no solution. There's nothing to solve, there's nothing to do. It's just a matter of you identifying the fact that an absolute value is never gonna be negative, okay? It doesn't matter what you take the absolute value are. The absolute value of anything, absolutely anything, is going to be a positive value, okay? You will never get a negative value when you have bars around it, okay? So that's why we know it's going to be no solution. So finally get into these practice problems of this section, okay? So here's the first one, and this is a radical equation because I do see a little house over the x, okay? So following those steps, the first step would be to isolate that term with the radical. So I'm essentially trying to get this whole term by itself, coefficient and all, okay? Just the whole term. So to do that, I need to minus the 4x over and I need to add the 5 over. So when I do that, I end up with negative 4x plus 5. Or you can write 5 minus 4x, same thing, okay? These are the same. But once I have this guy by himself and the 4x and the 5 on the other side, you are going to eventually take the index, which is the 2 here, and apply that as a power on both sides of the equation, okay? On the left side, negative 8 squared is 64. And the square root of x squared is just x, okay? On the right-hand side, you do have to write it twice and FOIL it all out, okay? So when negative 4x times negative 4x is positive 16x squared, negative 4x times 5 is negative 20x, 5 times negative 4x is negative 20x, and then 5 times 5 is 25. Now, if you look at this and assess, this is now a quadratic equation which needs to be equal to zero before you can factor it. So we do have to subtract 64x on both sides. So when I do that, I have all of these x's to combine. Negative 20 minus 20 minus 64 is negative 104. So now I have a negative 104x. That's how many x's I have. I owed somebody 20 x's, I owed somebody else 20 more x's, and I owed somebody else 64 x's. So now I owe a total of 104 X's, okay? From here, you've got to factor. And again, how awesome and fast you are at factoring matters, okay? You don't wanna sit here wasting so much time factoring that you forget what you're even doing, okay? Um, you have to be able to remember where you are in the process. So isolate the, the radical, square both sides, simplify everything, get it equal to zero, factor it, and then set each factor equal to zero, okay? So I did go ahead and do the AC method. I did 16 times positive 25, and I got a positive um, 400. 
then I knew that this sign right here would tell me the sign of the bigger number. And I just figured that a negative times a negative is the only way I would get a positive. So these smaller numbers had to be negative as well, okay? Um, and it just so happens that 100, and four, and 100 times four is 400. And when I add them together, I get 104. So I split this, right? That's the process of completing the square. I split this into negative 100x minus 4x using these signs. And so then you don't want to combine those because then you're going right back to where you were, okay? Once you have these four terms, you want to solve it by grouping. So you cut these in half, right? And you say, what do these two guys have in common? They could be divided by four and they have an x in common. So this divided by 4x is 4x. This divided by 4x is negative 25. Then you have to bring your minus sign down. And these do not have anything in common. So I can only factor out a one. Now I do know that it should match. So I normally just write the 4x minus 25 from this first parentheses. But then I literally distribute in my brain just to make sure that it's actually true. So negative one times 4x is negative 4x. And negative one times negative 25 is actually positive 25. So I know for a fact that this part is factored correctly. Then if you notice this half of the, of the expression and this half have something in common. They have that 4x minus 25 in parentheses in common. So if I took that out and I took that out, all I'd be left with is 4x minus one. And now I do eventually have it completely factored, okay? So you would set this first factor equal to zero, and then you would set this second factor equal to zero right here, okay? So first factor equal to zero and second factor equal to zero. On the left, I added 25 to both sides, which gave me 4x equal to 25. Then I divided by four on both sides and I ended up with x equal to 25 over four. On this side, I added one to both sides. That left me with 4x equal to one. Then I divided by four on both sides and I got x equal to one fourth, okay? And now I just need to check to see if they're correct. Remember to check your answers and you can use the calculator, okay? So I'm gonna check 25 over four first. So I'm gonna say four parentheses fraction, 25 over four, close the parentheses, minus eight square root fraction, 25 over four, get out because completely out of the house is the minus five. So I'm plugging in that X 25 over four for both X's. Now it should equal zero when I'm done. So I'm gonna hit enter and it does equal zero. Now I'm gonna copy this instead of having to retype everything. And I'm gonna change the 25 to a one. So I need to delete that extra digit, change the 25 to a one and delete the extra digit. Now I have plugged in one fourth, which is my other answer I wanna check, okay? When I hit enter, I do not get zero, which means that the negative one, four, I'm sorry, that the one fourth is one of those extraneous solutions, right? We did everything correct. It's just an extra answer that is not actually a solution, okay? The only actual solution is 25 over four. Okay, so for the second example, notice here we do have one radical. And so we are going to isolate that radical and we don't mind that it has a negative one coefficient. That's okay. We do not need to get rid of that coefficient. We just need to get the radical term by itself. So we minus five on both sides, resulting in X minus five on the right-hand side. And then now that negative, negative radical is by itself on the left-hand side. Once that radical is by itself, I'm going to go ahead and take this index of a two and apply it to both sides of the, of the equation. So the whole left side gets parentheses around it with the square and the whole right side gets parentheses around it with the square, okay? On the left-hand side, you're gonna use that exponent property that says you could take that negative one and square it, and then you can take this radical and square it. Now the negative one squared is positive one, 
And the radical squared just basically takes the radical out. So you get 4, 40 minus 12x. If this wasn't a one, you would actually have to distribute it. And since it is a one, you could really just not write it. But even if you do distribute it, you notice you get the same thing without the one there, okay? Over here, I had to actually FOIL it out. So I did x times x, x times negative five, negative five times x, and then negative five times negative five was positive 25. I did combine these two like terms right here to get negative 10 x, and then I reassessed it. What kind of equation is this now that both sides are as simplified as they can be? It's a quadratic equation. So I wanna get it equal to zero. So I'm gonna minus 40 on both sides and I'm going to add 12 on both sides, okay? And notice that on this side, I put the constant underneath the other constant and the variables underneath the other variables, okay? So here, both of them are going away. I have nothing, but here I have X squared. This combines to positive two X and this combines to negative 15. From there, I would factor it. And once you have your two factors, you're gonna set the first factor equal to zero and then the second factor equal to zero. Here, I would have to add three, giving me the result X equals three. And here I would have to minus five, giving me the result X equals negative five. Now, do they actually check out? It looks like they do because I have check marks on here, but let's go check. So in the original, negative, because it's in the very, very front, square root of 40 minus 12, and I'm gonna plug in three. Then I'm gonna come out of the house and hit plus five. Now remember, you gotta plug in X here and here. So since the X value that I'm checking is three, then when I hit equals, it better come out to three, okay? And it does. So we're perfectly good with that solution. Now I'm gonna plug in negative five. So I can copy this, but when I go to change that to a negative five, I'm gonna hit negative five and then I can close the parentheses and get out. And then again, I'm plugging in negative five for X. So that's what would be on this side is a negative five. So when I hit equals here, it should be negative five. And it is, so it does check out, okay? So both of those do check out. Here is the third practice problem. So here we have two radicals. I remember the strategy I gave you. If you have two, you have to pick one to isolate. So in this case, um, what I wanted to do, um, we just have, I like to isolate, I like to get the positive radical by itself. So it's this guy that I wanna get alone. So I need to get rid of this one. And the way to do that is to add that house to both sides. Now on this side, I just have one plus this new radical. On this side, this is gone and I just have the three radical X plus one. The little index here is a two, so I'm going to square both sides. Now, remember you can do three squared and then the radical squared. Over here, it's a plus, not a multiply. So you have to actually write it out two times and then FOIL. So one times one is one one times this radical is one times that radical. This radical times one is one times that radical. And then the radical times itself is that radical squared, okay? So then the three squared is nine, the house squared makes the house go away. Now I still have to distribute this nine to get nine X plus nine. And over here, we're gonna combine these two like terms so that becomes two square root of seven X plus eight. And then over here, the house and the square will cancel each other out, leaving me with seven X plus eight without a house, okay? From here, I notice that I still have a radical equation, which means I am going to need to get my radical expression isolated, okay? So what I've done, is I've taken the nine X and the positive nine that were already over here, and I minus the one over, I minus the seven X over, and I minus the eight over. So that all I would have left is the positive two square root of seven X plus eight, okay? Now, when I combine my like terms, it just so happens that nine minus one is eight, 
minus eight means all the constants are gone. And nine X minus seven X happened to be two X, okay? Then from here, notice that the index is a two, so we should apply a square on both sides. On the left-hand side, 2x squared is just 4x squared. On this side, we have to do 2 squared and then the radical squared. So we actually end up with 4, and then this guy without the house, just 7x plus 8. Then we'll distribute that 4, and we get 28 plus 32. Now when I'm looking at this, it is a quadratic, so I want to get it equal to 0. But because my x squared term is on the left side, I'm actually going to minus this over to the left, and I'm going to minus that over to the left. So I actually have an error in here, which I will fix when we get over there. It might explain why one of my answers did not work. Okay. So um, this would be a minus eight. So I do have a common factor here. And if you do, you must factor it out. So I factored out my four. When I did that, I ended up with x squared minus 7x and then minus 8. And then when I factor the x squared minus 7x minus 8, I ended up with x minus 8 and x plus 1. These guys multiply to give me negative 8, but combine to give me negative 7. Okay. Then I would set 4 equal to 0 because that is a factor, but there's no variables here to solve for, and 4 does not actually equal 0. Okay. So this is false right here, which means I get no solutions from that factor, okay? So I get no solutions from this factor. However, when I set x minus eight equal to zero, I get the solution x equals to eight. And when I set the factor x plus one equal to zero, I get the solution x equals negative one. Now, apparently, these are the only two solutions I found, but it looks like this one might be extraneous. It's just an extra one that happened throughout the math process, okay? How do we know which one or if any are extraneous or actual solutions? You plug them into the original, okay? So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna plug eight into this original equation. So three square root of eight plus one, get out of the house, minus square root of seven times eight plus eight. And when I hit equals, I should get one. And I do actually get one. So this one does check out. Now we're gonna check the um, negative one answer. So I'm gonna copy this and then I'm gonna type in negative one plus one. And then over here, I'm gonna type in negative one plus eight. And when I hit enter, it should equal one. But notice that this one equals negative one, okay? So it's not the same value, it is incorrect. So this one is not a solution, it's an extraneous solution. There we go. Okay, we do have some more. We have quite a bit and even some extra ones that you might not have in your, in your notes. Okay, so this one says solve the equation um, 3x to the one third plus x to the two thirds equal to eight. Now it does look, it's like some kind of polynomial type. So what we're gonna do is we're going to actually get it equal to zero. So notice that I did minus eight on both sides. And the other thing you wanna do is you wanna get it in descending order. And right now it's not because one third is smaller than two thirds. So I put the positive five X to the two thirds in the front, the positive three X to the one third behind it, and then the minus eight constant there. Now remember this fits that quadratic type description. I have a constant. And if I double this exponent, I get that exponent. So we're gonna let you equal the middle term without the coefficient. So u is equaling that one x cubed. And if I were to take u and square it and take x to the one third and square it, this would become u squared. And this would become one third times two, which is two thirds, okay? And if you don't believe me, type it in your calculator, one third 
times two, and you get that it's two thirds, okay? So that means that this X to the two thirds is gonna become U squared. And this X to the one third is going to become U according to these descriptions, okay? Then now this just looks like a quadratic, so you're going to factor it. When you factor this, again, if you don't know how to factor, you need to go practice and make sure you get the same answer, okay? But you need to know how to factor that. Once you factor it, you get your two factors, and then you're gonna set the two factors equal to zero, okay? When I set this first one equal to zero, I get negative eight divided by five. And when I solve the second factor equal to zero, I add one, so I get positive one. So, but the problem did not ask you to solve for u. The problem had originally x's in there. So once you have that, you have to do from here to here, you have to substitute. And then here you have to back sub. So you had somebody sit in, now you're gonna put in the real guy in its place back, okay? So u was actually x to the one third. So it's actually x to the one third that equals negative eight fifths and x to the one third that equals one. Now remember what x to the one third means. It means the index is three, but the exponent is one. So it really is just the cube root of x. And how do you get rid of the radical? You apply the same exponent, right? So that three, we're gonna apply a three exponent on both sides. When I do that over here, this exponent and the index will cancel, leaving me with just the x from the inside. And over here, negative 8 fifths raised to the third power, negative 8 over 5 raised to the third power is negative 5, 1, 2 over 125. Same thing here. This x to the 1 third becomes the cube root of x. So to get rid of the house, I applied the power on both sides and I got x by itself, and then one cube is just one. So I have both of these answers. I need to check them, right? So we're going to go to the original expression. Three parentheses, negative 5, 1, 2 over 1, 2, 5. Close the parentheses. Then I need to raise it to the 1 over 3. Get down plus five parentheses, negative five, one, two over 125, close that parentheses and raise it to the two fraction three, and then get down. When I hit enter, it should equal eight. And it does, so this answer checks out. Now I'm gonna do the same thing, but with one. So three, one raised to the one third, get down plus five parentheses one raised to the two thirds, get down. And then when I hit e enter, it should equal eight. And it does. So both of these check out. So both of them are our solutions. Now here's a practice problem with the absolute value. So this one's nice, they already have the bar expression completely by itself. There's nothing being added or subtracted or multiplied in the front. So we are going to follow the case one where we have a positive number on this side. And for case one, it said to take the inside equal to that number exactly, and then the inside equal to the negative of that number. And so then I'm gonna solve both equations by minusing three first and then dividing by five next. And so for this equation, I end up with nine divided by five, which is nine fifths. And on this side, I end up with negative 15 divided by five, which is negative three. And then you do need to check them into your answer, okay? So I don't know if this one does the absolute value bars. I think it does. Yes, so see that? Let me start over. You go to math, and then you go to the right where it says number. And then you see this ABS, that's absolute value. Okay, so if I hit that, notice it puts the bars on my computer. And I'm gonna type in five parentheses, um, nine over five, and close those parentheses because that's what I'm plugging in for X, then plus three. And when I hit enter, it should be a 12. And it is, so this one checks out. Now, if I go back in there, and now I wanna type in negative three. So I need to delete this fraction 
parentheses, delete. Okay, so I'm going to type in parentheses and I'm going to plug in negative three and then my plus three. So it's this expression, but with negative three plugged in. And then when I hit enter, it should also be 12. And it is. So both of these check out. So again, to get the absolute value bars, you're going to go to math all by itself, go to the right for number, and then you can either hit enter, you can hit enter, or you can hit the number one. Either one of them is going to place those bars on your screen. See, if I go to math and then number, and then I hit enter, it puts the bars on your screen. So whether you hit the one or you, you like option one, or you hit the equals, it'll put the bars. Okay, the next one is this problem here. Okay, so it says solve the equation here. Now, I don't know, this is not an actual number. It's a whole expression, right? So I don't know if this expression is gonna be negative for a particular X value or not, okay? I'm going to assume that it will be positive, okay? So that I can go to find those solutions. So if we take this and we take the inside, we follow case one. So when you have variables over here, follow case one. And what case one tells me is to take what's inside the bars and equal it to exactly what's out here. And then write the word or, and what's inside the bars again, equal to the opposite of what's out there, okay? So when I solve this equation, um, I notice that it's an x squared equation, so I'm gonna get it equal to zero by minusing four x and minusing 36. I didn't have any constant over here, so I just put the minus 36 underneath. But essentially what you end up with is x squared, and then here you end up with positive 5x, and then this negative 36. And on the right-hand side, you should have zero. Then you would factor that side. Once you have those factors, you're gonna set this factor equal to zero, you're gonna set this factor equal to zero, and then you're gonna solve those resulting equations, giving you these two solutions, okay? Over here, when you did the opposite, the opposite of the whole expression, so it does have to have those parentheses, you can take that negative and go ahead and distribute it. When I distribute that negative, I get negative 4x and negative 36. This is still a quadratic, so I still want to get it equal to zero. So what you'll do is you'll add the 4x and you'll add the 36 to the other side. Then when you combine your like terms, you end up with the expression x squared plus 13x plus 36 equal to zero, okay? Then you would factor this expression. Once you have those factors, you're gonna set one factor equal to zero, then the other factor equal to zero and solve those resulting factors. Now notice I did get negative nine twice. So there's negative nine, but then I have a positive four over here and a negative four over there. So potentially I have three potential solutions. I just need to verify if one of them is an actual solution, two of them are actual solutions, three, all three are actual solutions, or if none of them are actual solutions. And so how do we do that? We have to check it into this original equation. So when I plug in negative nine, okay, negative nine squared is gonna be a positive 81. And positive nine times a negative nine is this negative 81. Four times negative nine is negative 36, and this is the plus 36. In the bars, I get zero, and out here, I also get zero. And the absolute value of zero is equal to zero, which means negative nine is a solution, okay? Then over here, when I check four, four squared is 16, Positive nine times four is 36. Four times four is 16, and the 36 is just there. Here, when I add those inside, I get 52. When I add these on this side, I get 52. The absolute value of 52 is 52. So positive four checks out. Then finally, I plug in negative four. So negative four squared, that's negative four times negative four, which is a positive 16. Then positive nine times negative four is a negative 36. Then four times negative four is a negative 16. And then the 36 just comes down. 
When I subtract those, I get negative 20. When I subtract these, I get positive 20. And the absolute value of negative 20 is equal to positive 20. So the negative four checks out as well. So all three will be my solution, okay? Now the last example is this equation that looks like this at the beginning. So this was the original, the original equation. And what we need to know is that in order for us to, let's think about this. When you have the square root of x equal to two, um, you write the index for this and then you apply that index on both sides, right? That was how we solved radical equations. Well, I want you to notice something that wasn't mentioned, okay? This we know is x to the one half, the exponent in here divided by the index. And this is two over one. I'm not messing with that side over there, okay? Notice that the, the exponent on the inside is the reciprocal of the exponent on the outside. And what happens when you do that? You end up with x to the two over two, which is just x to the one, which is just x. The right-hand side eventually becomes four, okay? So keep in mind that when you have an exponent and then you multiply by its, or raise it to its reciprocal, you end up with an expression without the house and without the exponent, okay? So similarly, that's what happens here, is if I wanna get rid of this fraction exponent, I'm gonna have to apply the reciprocal exponent on both sides of the equation. Now on the left side, we already know that the fives are gonna cancel, the twos are gonna cancel. And so you really just end up with the x minus four without an exponent at all, okay? Just like what happened here. This exponent canceled with that exponent and I just got the x all by itself. Here it happens to be an x minus four. So when this exponent cancels with that exponent, it's x minus four that you end up with. Over here though, you can type that in your calculator. You can type four raised to the two over five. And it gives you this big ugly decimal. Um, if you're not allowed to type in the decimal, then what you want to do is put this back in its radical form, okay? And so if you remember, five is the index, and then four is the, or the two is the exponent, okay? And so then you have x minus four equal to the fifth root, four squared is 16. And if I still am trying to solve for x, you're going to add four on both sides, and so you end up with x equaling the fifth root of 16 plus four. Now, if they ask you for the exact answer, this is it. You cannot simplify this radical anymore and you cannot add radicals and non-radicals together. So this is your exact answer. If they tell you to round, then you can go ahead and type five radical 16, get out of the house, plus four, and you'll get the decimal value 5.74, okay? Um, so you can type it in a calculator to get that decimal. And then this would be the rounded answer. So you do have to pay attention to those instructions on whether or not they ask you for the exact answer or the rounded answer. And just FYI, if the instructions never say the words round, then they want the exact answer. Okay, if they do tell you to round, then that's how you'll know you need to round. But that is the end of this section. So I hope you guys practice your factoring really, really well. Get that down because it's going to keep coming back every single section, every single unit that we cover. Okay, um, but these problems are long and lengthy. They need a lot of practice. So factoring needs a lot of practice and so does solving all of these equations. Please practice, practice, practice. But I wish you luck and happy computing. <laughs>